I'm from a community of homeless people. We're homeless people with HIV, with AIDS, and we don't want to just die. We're not going to be silent because silent equals death. Housing, not shelters. AIDS, housing now. Willing to housing, willing not shelters. AIDS, housing now. We're talking about the fact that they don't allow people of color into their trials. We're talking about the fact that they don't care about women, they don't care about children, and that their trials are inefficient, dysfunctional, and we're here to let them know that we're not going to tolerate it anymore. There's a reason why the quote-unquote drugs into bodies position um, is inadequate, uh, because it simply doesn't account for uh, the historical oppression of um, either gay people or people of color or women. It's strange because at one time, the Department of Health was giving out condoms like crazy, you know? But very seldom would they give you dental dance, you know? Now we think, now but think about fuck. As we fuck, now but think about fuck. This nut might, now but think about fuck. Kill us, now but think about fuck. There might be, now but think about fuck. A pin sized, now but think about fuck in the condom. Across the United States, gay men, lesbians, bisexuals, transgenderals are embroiled in a bitter battle to claim their civil and human rights. While the religious right mobilizes to implement anti-gay measures state by state. Abomination, it's an abomination. Mankind shall not lie with mankind, for it is an abomination in his sight. Stop the church! 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 Stop the church. Stop the church. Stop the church. I am very much concerned about AIDS, and I believe that we've got the best researchers in the world out there at NIH working the problem. It's one of the few diseases where behavior matters. And I once called... Basically what we're doing is blasting the horns every 12 minutes to remind people that statistically right now, every 12 minutes someone in America is dying from AIDS. The premise of ACT UP sort of implies that they have nothing to lose, 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 they have nothing to lose. Plague! We are in the middle of a fucking plague! And you behave like this! Forty million infected people is a fucking plague! As each T cell disappears from my body, it's replaced by ten pounds of pressure, ten pounds of rage, ten pounds of pressure, ten pounds of rage, and I focus that rage into nonviolent resistance, but the focus is starting to slip. The focus is starting to slip. America, America, America seems to understand and accept murder as self-defense against those who would murder other people. And it's been murder on a daily basis for eight, nine, ten, eleven, count them, ten long years. And we're expected to quietly and politely pay taxes, support this public and social murder. murder. And we're expected to quietly and politely make house in this windstorm murder. But I say there's certain politicians that have better increase the security forces. And there's religious leaders and healthcare officials that have better get bigger fucking dogs. At the moment, I'm a 37-foot tall 
1,172 pound man inside this six foot body. And all I can feel is the pressure. All I can feel is the pressure and the need for relief. When the living can no longer speak, the dead may speak for them. Let the whole earth hear us now. We beg, we pray, we demand that this epidemic end. Hi, welcome to Vibration Cinema, the altered destiny of film. To celebrate Pride this year, we are continuing our channel series, Gaze in Film, by looking primarily at AIDS video activism while nodding to other AIDS artistic activist endeavors. Alexander Juhasz of Women AIDS Video Enterprise, or WAVE, and the author of the most comprehensive theoretical and historical book on AIDS video activism, AIDS TV, Identity, Community, and Alternative Video, describes AIDS alternative media as a use of media to speak from within and to a politicized community, to effectively construct and communicate that politicized community first to itself and then perhaps to a broader audience. Mainstream AIDS media is produced by corporations using official quote-unquote experts like doctors and politicians for the straight, presumably seronegative audience. AIDS video activism is often self-funded and AIDS, AIDS activist media is I made by and for people with AIDS and those who are at a high risk of contracting HIV AIDS. So with that in mind, let's continue by situating AIDS video activism in history. It might seem intuitive that we begin with GRID and the emergence of AIDS activism in the early 1980s, but the video component of this history begins in the 19-teens with the Soviet agit propagandists like Ziga Vertov and the Kino Pravda, who basically started political educational filmmaking. We can trace the influence of the 60s New American Left Film Collective newsreel, and with the emergence of the Porta Pack in 1967, the influence of video activists like Video Freaks and TV TV. Third cinema practitioners, direct cinema documentarians, and MTV are also precursors and influences on AIDS video activists, and second wave feminist filmmakers of the 70s, like Barbara Hammer, would go on to produce AIDS videos. In the early 1980s, camcorders, VCRs, offline editing systems, and satellite coalesce as the AIDS crisis develops. Sony, Panasonic, RCA, and Hitachi all launched consumer camcorders in 1985. The same year AIDS coverage skyrocketed with the death of actor Rock Hudson and Ryan White's legal battle to return to school. Paper Tiger Television, a grassroots public access guerrilla TV collective founded in 1981, launched Deep Dish Television, the first public access satellite network in 1986, which is one year before Testing the Limits, the first AIDS activist video collective was founded, and three years before the formation of Diva TV. Deep Dish Television was a major broadcaster of AIDS activist media. Importantly, these more democratic media tools coincide in a time where the Reagan administration implemented deregulation measures which consolidated media industries, so the birth of independent grassroots media becomes an alternative to the hegemonic news media conglomerates. The flexibility of video and the decentralized groups producing these videos allowed AIDS video activists to accomplish many goals simultaneously, including safer sex education, correcting misinformation about HIV AIDS, particularly around transmission, creating an archive of people with AIDS, talking about their experiences for the historical record, fostering community, counter surveillance, documentation of legal evidence, and memorializing PWAs. New York, as the epicenter of the epidemic and its activism, as well as having the most robust public TV infrastructure, became the biggest city for AIDS activist video. As is natural with the capitalist organization of the economy, rich and middle class people with disposable income and spare time are more easily positioned to have the resources to buy and rent the equipment and facilities necessary for production. However, at the same time, groups like the Canadian activist art collective Grand Fury and the San Francisco Bay Area AIDS zine Diseased Pariah News stole technology and pirated software. The New York-based groups would pool resources and help on each other's projects. House of Color, a video collective of AIDS video activists of color, would use ACT UP funds, and Diva TV had a mailing list for equipment and crew sharing. GMHC, which was co-founded by Paul Rappaport, gave access to its editing suites to AIDS organizations who were otherwise unaffiliated with it. Downtown Community Television would also 
also provide post support for AIDS video. In the aftermath of Rappaport's death in 1987 at the age of 47 from AIDS-related complications, his estate established a foundation in his name to help with LGBT and AIDS-related causes, including video activist work around the city. Public funding was spotty, especially since public arts funding was already being cut. Additionally, many of these government-run programs would censor AIDS and LGBT-related media. One thinks of Tongues Untied and PBS in this instance, which we will be covering later in the summer with our censorship video. In the absence of a cure, communicating safer sex practices, available treatment options, and other pertinent information was literal life-saving work for people in the void of government inaction and the mainstream media misinformation. We're mostly talking about communicating information here, and video is cheap enough to buy and use, and satellite networks make it easy for mass dissemination and distribution across the continent. As an activist artist, Greg Bordowitz talks about how the quality and clarity of information and the spread of that information is the hallmark of AIDS artwork, nothing so lofty as the quality of image fidelity. AIDS video activism is decentralized and addresses various communities affected by AIDS. This means that certain AIDS videos were made by and for certain people and not others. Latin AIDS video activists, for example, explain why their videos play like telenovas and not the agitprop style of white middle-class video activists. Manuel! Mama! Latina filmmaker and AIDS activist Marina Alvarez says, quote, Traditionally, when we think of activism, we envision protest marches, sit-ins, and more formal lobbying activities. If we limit ourselves to that definition, we fail to recognize the kind of quiet, often familial activism that takes place in the Latino communities. Resistance to oppression and oppressive conditions occurs in many forms. Jose Gutierrez Gomez agrees by observing, If people cannot relate what they're being taught to their lives, the educational message falls on deaf ears. Taken as a constellation of various collectives and not as a unified movement, AIDS video activism is therefore formless. AIDS interacts with neoliberal economics, immigration rights, the war on drugs, mass incarceration, public education, health administration, sex work, and more. AIDS activists and their video comrades understood this and used AIDS as a starting point for a more general political coalition. AIDS is a human issue. It's everyone's issue. It doesn't belong to one sexuality or to one race or to one group of people. It's everybody's issue. I wanted to take a moment to highlight some of the work that shows how to these videos can be? Let's start with women. Juanita Muhammad, member of WAVE, directed We Care, a documentary about black women with AIDS and their caretakers. The film uses a book of myth and book of fact motif to teach women about HIV AIDS, how it spreads, preventative measures, treatments, and services that are available. It also encourages and teaches people how to care for someone with AIDS, even if you aren't a medical professional. In 1988, Dr. Robert E. Gould published an article in Cosmo magazine that said good Christian heterosexual women in monogamous relationships practicing vanilla sex could not get HIV AIDS, even if their partner is a carrier. A major bigoted lie. Jean Carla Muster responded with her seminal Doctors, Liars, and Women, AIDS Activists Say No to Cosmo, which corrected these lies and explained how HIV AIDS is a virus which does not discriminate. Women, straight and lesbian, directly confront the psychologist in the video. And I think it also made the group coalesce more because we all felt the power of sitting there and being able to each one play off the other one and each of us knew like a different tactic to take. In Target City Hall, filmmakers interviewed women activists who were sexually abused by police officers under the guise of safety searches during the booking process. This footage caught the eye of mainstream media and the attention it garnered eventually led to a successful lawsuit against the precinct. These activists also talked about how strip searches affect not just activists but prisoners more broadly. AIDS video activists also made videos about HIV positive prisoners and the need for universal health Care. They also drew connections between the social pariahs that AIDS disproportionately affects to the targets of the prison system, homosexuals, immigrants, drug users, black people, and the working poor. The American Indian Community House of New York produced Native Americans, Two Spirits, and HIV, a documentary about a gathering of indigenous AIDS activists in 1991. The film recenters Two Spirit people as spiritual leaders and healers in the fight against AIDS and discusses the intersection of drug use and HIV on the reservations. Richard Fung produced Fighting Chance, an educational video for Asian Americans with HIV, those who support them and their families who may be ignorant about HIV. The film stresses
emphasizes the importance of education as a way to help prevent the spread of HIV rather than the inevitable outcome of being homosexual. Feng links U.S. mandatory testing laws to the Chinese Exclusion Act to demonstrate how AIDS discrimination is a racist anti-immigration policy. AIDS activists understood how important it was to reach general audiences who might not watch public access television or frequent art galleries. In Chicago, Grand Fury did a billboard and public transit campaign called Kissing Doesn't Kill, Greed and Indifference Do to correct the misunderstanding of how the virus spreads and to shed light on the actual problem, which is a governmental indifference to the crisis. Like most of their campaigns, the text was in English and in Spanish. AIDS activists even got involved in the anti-Gulf War movement. This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. We're going to take a break for a commercial just now. We'll break for a commercial. Thank you very much. AIDS affects everyone, and this moment of politicization and relatively cheaper equipment allowed for a decentralized kaleidoscopic approach to community building, education, information sharing, and political consciousness raising. About a decade after it began, AIDS video activism started to decline. Generally speaking, there were AIDS activists who wanted to stay focused exclusively on people with AIDS and not lose focus with broader political coalitions. This is exemplified by members of ACT UP splitting from the organization in 1992 to form the Treatment Action Group. Ideological differences began to sharpen, which fractured the already loosely structured movement. In their final piece, Good Luck, Miss You, Grand Fury notes that Reagan and Bush were easy targets to demonize with their stupid, cartoonishly evil indifference to the epidemic, but Clinton, though weak on the issue, was difficult for activists to target. Now, will you just calm down? I feel your pain. I feel your pain. But if you want to attack me personally, you're no better than Jerry Brown and all the rest of these people that say whatever sounds good in the moment. If you want something to be done, you ask me a question, you listen. If you don't agree with me, go support somebody else for president, but quit talking to me like that. This is not a matter of personal attack. It's a matter of human loss. because I'm dying from AIDS. And it doesn't matter to me who the next president is if they don't change 11 years of government neglect of this epidemic. Shaming in a macro-political arena wasn't as an effective tactic anymore. I don't know if you want to call this manufactured consent or normalization or whatever, but AIDS became just a hard fact of life. It was no longer novel, kind of like how COVID-19 is today. This time also coincides with the release of Heart, a major breakthrough in the management of AIDS in the mid-90s. Finally, it cannot be overstated the effect of watching your friends and family die rapidly en masse, working and demonstrating in visiting friends in the hospital and attending funerals every week while managing your own declining health. To see the ineffectualness of your work, despite its successes, in the sea of mainstream media and political inaction, which endangered many more people than your alternative video could hope to reach. It's all very demoralizing, disheartening, and depressing. Towards the mid-90s, some AIDS video activists lamented that they were not so much changing the world as creating documentaries of their own death. The matrix created by these phenomenon led to the eventual end of AIDS video activism. But the history remains. In the mid-1990s, Patrick Moore, then head of the Estate Project for Artists with AIDS, saw all of this going on and decided to look into archiving these works for fear they could disappear. It was a phenomenal task at the time. Most archives could not handle video as a medium or the volume of material. According to Jim Hubbard, who was tasked with finding a good home for these tapes, the Museum of Modern Art would only buy two tapes per year. James Wincy, a prolific AIDS video activist, alone had over 750 tapes, many of which were two-hour source material. Some institutions had the capacity for the archive but didn't want to touch anything AIDS-related. The New York Public Library was eventually chosen as the home for the archive. The estate hired Wincy to remaster and transfer the wide array of formats into a standard beta SP, which was the highest quality analog format at the time. Given the nature of the arrangement with the New York Public Library, the donors of the tapes hold the rights. There was, at a time, that one could watch these videos, but in recent years, though the archive is now mostly digitized, the library seemingly refuses such access, even for artists and filmmakers to repurpose those tapes. In an interview with Dagmar Bernau, Published in 2019, Hubbard says that the library refuses to get a general exhibition permission from the artists, so there is still a level of precarity to this history. Hubbard would move on to work with Harvard on the ACT UP Oral History Project, which is an online compendium of ACT UP members and their affiliates recalling the era. I'm not sure if all of the video interviews are available in full, but the transcripts have been published online in full through this archive. Deep Dish Television, James Wincy, Alex Juhas, Ray Navarro, all have some of their AIDS activist work hosted on their Vimeos, and Visual AIDS continues to 
to spread awareness of AIDS through art. So go check those out. AIDS video activists did incredibly vital and necessary work. They did it in free fall, mistakes were made, blind spots became clearer in hindsight. It isn't a nice, cleanly packaged history. We can bemoan the whiteness and middle classness of the movement, but that seems like dead in moralism when instead we can glean strategies they used which we can improve on and modernize for our own contemporary moment. Something that I've been thinking about recently is media ecosystems. And I mean, not to get all Enzenberger on everybody, but a decentralized assortment of collectives talking to their respective communities in ways they know can work and having that network share the resources to do so alongside ensuring hard facts and science are up to date and correct is actually brilliant and necessary. The question of audience in our contemporary moment seems to be beating people's asses, but the AIDS video activists gave us an answer, a 360 degree engagement with all people who are affected by the virus, which is of course everybody, while still focusing their attention on seropositive people and those who are at a higher risk of becoming so. The great feat of ACT UP was the ability to bring all these people together and have all of these people sort of imbue these people with knowledge, imbue these people, empower them if you want to use that word, and then these folks went out to do other work. You know, but today we have a heavily consolidated media industry that has hijacked how we can even think about what media is and how it operates. Celebrity activists, excess journalism, and neoliberal hyper-individualism have tricked us into thinking that I, this one person, with my movie or my article or my speech can save the world. And that isn't the case. And our next episode tackles how the industry hijacks what we think of cinema through cultural imperialism. So be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you don't miss out. I think for this topic, the politics was necessary to highlight, but before we go, and I'm sure you've seen throughout the clips I've curated, I wanted to say that AIDS filmmakers were very visual and visceral in imaging their activism. As a collective, I would place them as the best cinema has to offer in the last third of the century. Literal, iconic work. I knew of general ideas as AIDS before Robert Indiana's love. But that's it for today. Like, comment, and share. If you are interested in learning more about art, AIDS, and activism, I've left some readings down below. Love you all madly. See you on the next one.